Great singing. Please be seated. Amen. That's a great thought. Getting God's fire in our life and, and getting excited about the things of God. I hope that you are today because there's a lot of great things God wants to do with each and every one of our lives. And if we get close to God, His fire will burn in our hearts and we'll just kind of get, get excited about the things that matter most. And that, that, of course, revolves around Him and His glory and His honor. Let's go to John 14 tonight. John chapter uh, number 14. Uh, of course, over the last few weeks, we've been in this series that's entitled Fighting Fear. Fighting Fear or, or, uh, or Conquering Fear, however you want to put it. But we live in a world that creates uh, such an anxiousness within our souls. I remember uh, occasionally, I haven't seen this for a while, but I would occasionally, especially during COVID, I would get on my phone, I have the Weather Channel app on my phone, and every once in a while the Weather Channel would have a, have a blip that comes up, and it was, and it was something uh, that, would, that was some sort of news that was, in essence, if you look into it, it could cause fear. And I, I joked with my wife and I said, oh, look, I'm getting my daily alert of what I'm supposed to be afraid of today. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I think I shut the, the notifications off because I was like, whatever. Uh, the world is, is, is very much involved in creating an anxiousness within the soul of individuals because that sells, actually. It gets you coming back for more, whatever it is that's publishing it. But that creates a lot of stress in the heart too, doesn't it? People use, of course, many devices or antidotes that they can find in this world to try to combat the fears that they have. But at best, they give a temporary fix that over the course of time just simply wears off and eventually no longer works because that's all it is, is a temporary fix, a band-aid to a bigger problem. Sadly, Christian people, we can use the same antidotes we can chase the same devices to deal with our stresses and our fears and our anxiety, and they will fall sh short for us too. However, especially for us who are saved here, the consequences can be even more devastating as the anxieties can take us out of the will of God and cause us to disobey His Word. Even the most glaring, most basic things that we know to be right, if fear controls us, we will break those. We will break those real, real quick. There's only negative consequences that come about when we are in, when fear controls our lives. You know, tonight there are mission fields today without missionaries because God's called some, but some have been too afraid to go. There are tonight churches today that are underfinanced because people are afraid to tithe. Today, there, there are Christians living substandard Christian lives, not living in victory, not, not to having their soul set afire because they're afraid of every last thing that there is. And they, and they live choked with fear every single day of their lives. And it's sad when you're a born-again Christian, you and I don't have to fear. We've been delivered. We have been delivered. Fear not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. For I will strengthen thee, I will help thee, I will uh, uh, uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. God is there, and he, he wants us to not be people who are choked by fear. The power of our Christianity is on full display when we live by faith, which frees us from the shackles of fear. And far too often we may not be getting what God has for us because of fear. It will send our Christianity into a state of, of being anemic and faltering given right circumstances. John 14 here tonight is found amongst the, the last teachings of Jesus before he's about to go to the cross. And he knew his disciples were going to face some serious things. Their, their whole world was about to turn upside down and they were going to be facing fearful things. But he's trying to teach them things about what's to come and how the Holy Spirit of God was going to come upon them and how, how what appears to be a defeat is going to be a total victory and all these things and, and uh, how to live in this world really without his, his physical presence here. But John 14, verse 27 is a good verse we'll use as our springboard tonight. It says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. 
You know, those, that verse communicates so well God's desire for you and I. God doesn't want us to live constantly in a state of trouble, of a troubled heart, and a fearful, or a fearful heart. He wants us to live in victory. And today we're going to continue our series as we dig into more of how we are to be, as my, I've entitled my message tonight, Combating Fear. Combating Fear. Let's pray and then we'll get into it more tonight. Father, we thank you for this truth that we are looking at tonight. I pray that uh, it will continue to help us understand fear and how to get the victory over it, to fight it, so to say, in our lives, so that you may be glorified, that we would live in submission to you, live by faith uh, in you, so that we can bring glory to your name. We ask your blessing tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, just in brief review tonight, you know, we've looked at what fear does to an individual. You know, we, we said that and we saw that it robs us of a meaningful life. Again, a, a, as I mentioned, there are Christian people, you're, they're living a substandard Christian life because their life is so shackled with fear. They can't live by faith. And any faith that they have, they pull back from because fear robs them. Remember, Jesus said the thief comes but not to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus came that we might have life and that more abundantly. The fear will rob you of an abundant life with Jesus Christ. It will rob it. It, it. it does. It will prevent you and I from doing the things that God wants us to do. On top of that, it will be tormenting. The Bible says in the book of 1 John chapter 4, I believe it's verse 18, that fear hath torment. And if you've ever been scared or fearful, you know how tormenting that is to the soul. Fear itself will drive us uh, to, to find relief any way that we can. And oftentimes, if we don't find it biblically, we will find it unbiblically, or at least think that we do. And, and people always try to find ways to escape fear because they, we naturally want personal security, right? But fear itself is a tormenting emotion. It, it, it drives people crazy sometimes, literally. It, it, it also unravels our spiritual life completely. Again, uh, it, it hinders our ability to live by faith. And, and if we can't live by faith, we cannot please God. Hebrews 11.6 tells us that. It also creates emotional and physical problems. We got into, the, got into some of the nuts and bolts as far as what it does to us physically. Fear itself and stress are, are related. And if we, if we continue to live in a state of constant stress and constant fear, there are a lot of negative physical consequences that, that can attach to our, that will be attached to that. And we got into some of those things, particularly with the heart and, and other things within our bodies. Fear, at least the negative sort, is not our friend. And that's why we want to fight it. We want to fight it and we want to defeat it. Now, our fears come as a result of our sinful condition. Remember back in the book of Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, what was the first emotion that they uh, experienced? It was fear. You know, God came looking for them in the garden there, and Adam and Eve hid themselves, and he said uh, that, uh, that, and God called all to him, and he said, and Adam said he was afraid, right? Because he had eaten of that forbidden tree. So sin ushered in that emotion of fear. And we as people are all born, of course, in Adam's image as sinners, and as a result, naturally born, separated from God. So we learn initially to function and cope and survive void of God's presence and his word in this life. And the longer this drags on in a person's life, the more of a grip that fear can get into the mind. And we, say, and we, we address what that is. That's actually what the Bible refers to as a stronghold. A stronghold is a pattern of thought that is burned into our minds. Where, in other words, that, it's to the point where we automatically think that. Uh, it, it takes very little effort. And it's very hard to change, at least without God's help. Most of our fears are rooted in our childhood experiences. You know, if you had some, some experiences in your childhood that were not all that great, most likely you've developed... Uh, and forgive me for using the word complex, but I think you understand what I mean. There's an issue there that God wants you to confront. Sometimes it, those fears can also be brought about from a traumatic experience. A, a traumatic experience can really uh, establish a, a stronghold of fear within a person's life that, that uh, cannot be defeated on its own. 
When we don't have God's presence nor understand how to respond to things the way he wants, we tend to respond wrongly, which develops, of course, naturally the wrong emotional feelings. Now, when we get saved, God has placed us on a new platform with himself. But unfortunately, the old thought patterns we developed void of God don't automatically get deleted. You know, our, our brain doesn't all of a sudden hit reset, right? Now, that would be nice, be simple, I mean, be convenient, but that's not the way it works. The way we thought as an unsaved person, especially if we got saved, you know, as a little later in life, you know what, we still think that way. And it's going to take some time to undo those thought processes. But we get a new platform at salvation, and God begins to work there. The Bible tells us that what God begins to do is to renew our minds. Romans 12, 2, we've seen in the past where, where it talks about being not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the what? Renewing of your mind. The renewing of your mind. The word renewing just simply means reformatting or reprogramming, basically. All of our minds are programmed uh, by what we, what we have taken in. And God wants to do away with the bad and bring in the good. Of course, his good comes from his, directly from his word. That's all it is. He wants us to change that. Because as we think, so shall we be. The Bible says in Proverbs 23, 7, he that thinketh in his heart, so is he. Right? The way we think inside is the person that we are. And God wants us to align our thinking biblically. In order to combat our fears, we have to change our belief system. We have to change our belief system about the things that we are fearing. And as our belief system changes, in other words, it gets aligned with God's word, It'll naturally change how we feel. You can't control how you feel, but you control how you think. And when you get the thinking down, it'll, it'll naturally play out in the way you feel. And that's where you get the victory. And as I mentioned before, this is more than just positive thinking. Okay, we got to remember that what we sometimes determine as positive thinking may not be positive biblically speaking. You know, Sometimes, sometimes just people think, well, if I just think positive thoughts, well, what define positive. Define positive. And for some people, it, positive would mean maybe be something that doesn't necessarily align with God's word. What we want is not the power of positive thinking. We want the power of biblical thinking. That's a big difference. Where our minds align with his word. Our thinking aligns with what he says. And we come to believe it within the heart. You couple that with God's abiding presence, and we'll find ourselves getting greater victory over fear. So tonight we're going to continue on this thought of combating fear as we see, first off, our security in Christ. Our security in Christ. Freedom from fear will be found the more we understand our identity in Christ. Okay? Our identity in Christ. Say, so what does that mean? Our identity in Christ. Our identity in Christ is the way that God views us and the way he wants us to think about ourselves in light of him. Okay? It's who we are now since we've been saved. We've been given a new identity. We traded in the card that said devil's child, and we got a card, if you will, <laughs> That says God's child. We, we, took, we, we, we ditched heaven, or hell's passport and we got heaven's passport. We got a new identity completely the day we got saved. So much happened that day. That moment in time when you embraced salvation as God lays out in his word. So much happened. And we've talked about that. And one of the biggest things that happens is that you and I are viewed by God much differently now that we are, we are saved. See, God has said in his word multiple things. What he thinks of us as now that we are his adopted child. We are his adopted child. See, there's rights and privileges and knowledge that we didn't have before. But now they're ours. Again, before we were saved, God wasn't part of our life's equation. If you go to the book of Ephesians chapter number 2, Ephesians chapter 2, Paul puts it so, so clearly here. 
Now he's talking about in Ephesians 2 and in times past how we walked according to the course of this world and so forth, but then we get saved. And uh, uh, we are now His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works in verse 10. But verse 12 here, again, reflects on the unsaved life. That at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. I mean, it just says it so plainly. The unsaved person has no hope, and they don't have God in this world. Okay? God wasn't part of our life equation as unsaved people. That reality is on full display when death, tragedy, or problems hit. When we need help outside of ourselves and we cannot find it. But the day we get saved, what happens is we get the presence of God that enters into our life, right? We get the abiding Holy Spirit of God that comes within. And the Bible says in Hebrews 13, 5, that he will never leave us nor forsake us, right? His, price, his presence in our lives makes a tremendous difference. You know, think, for instance, a young kid who gets separated from their parents and they get pretty f- fearful about that. Then all of a sudden they see mom and dad and it's like, oh, safety, and they run to them and they find security there. Well, that's what God wants to do, wants us to do in him. God's a far greater parent than any of us ever could be. And we can find security in his presence because of what he thinks of us. All spelled out in the identity he has now given to us as his child. Psalm 57, if you want to flip over there, Psalm chapter number 57. We'll get more into the presence part as we get into this message here, but this is a great verse. Be merciful unto me, O God. Be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. You know, God wants us to find security in his presence. And his presence will give us security, which is a sense of protection from that danger that calms us. You know, there was an Old Testament prophet, if you go to 2 Kings chapter number 6, by the name of Elisha. And there was a king that came up against him, and he had a bunch of, uh, of his chariots and horsemen encircling the town that he was in. And his assistant, Gehazi, went out and saw these, and he got very afraid by what he saw. And, but Elisha, the prophet, was like, he wasn't too concerned. But then he realized that Gehazi couldn't see what what he could see, and he, and he praised God, would you open his eyes? And, and Gehazi got a chance to glimpse at what was around all of them, protecting them. Look at 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 14. It says, Therefore sent he hither horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God, this was Gehazi, was risen early and gone forth, behold, and the host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And the servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire, Round about Elisha. <laughs> Where did Elisha find his security? Not in the not in the presence of man, but in the presence of God. There were, and, and he could see it. And of course, they saw it physically in this case. Now you might say it might be a little bit easier for me to trust the Lord and find security in him if I could just see those chariots of fire. Wouldn't that be nice sometimes? <laughs> I don't know. That actually might be a little freaky if you think about it here. But... Uh, God gave us something more sure than just something that we see. And that's the security and the promises of his word, right? The Bible says, mentions in 2 Peter 1.19, we have a more sure word of prophecy. You've got to remember, everything we see isn't necessarily real. You say, how can that be? Oh, it can be. Sometimes we, what we see physically is not really what we think. You ever heard of an optical illusion? <laughs> that's what I thought it was, but it really wasn't, right? And some things in life aren't always though as they appear. You'd be surprised sometimes. Especially if you watch TV. <laughs> Guess what? Everything isn't exactly the way the news media puts it. 
Oh, boy, really? I thought they'd just tell all the truth and nothing but the truth. Yeah, right. You can take a Bible and compare it to what they're... Like, really? Really? No, the Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight, right? 2 Corinthians 5, 7. We have a more sure word of prophecy. And God wants us to be, have confidence in exactly what he says. The reason we struggle with God's word comforting our hearts about God's presence goes back to the way we, again, have been programmed to think. We can't see God, so we don't feel secure. But when we come to the point where we can trust God's word, we see through faith, and our hearts are reassured that he is near. Now, you may say, I don't have that kind of faith, though. Well, our problems stem from the fact God's word is not infused into our hearts as much as that wrong thinking is. Okay? And when biblical thoughts don't control our thinking, we will react unbiblically, which creates the fears. But God's presence now is in our lives will help us change that. And understanding who we are in Jesus Christ, our identity in him as a child of God, is designed to bring us much security a sense of protection that calms us. Knowing that we are loved and nourished and cared for by our Heavenly Father and that He is in absolute control and that whatever it is that comes into our lives will bring about a greater good. God will, will provide the needs within the hearts to help us feel accepted, secure, and significant. And if we don't sense those things, we do get fearful. But only God can be the source of all those three things that I mentioned. Because he's the only one who is infinitely capable of providing these things. Other people or other things just can't do that. Who we are in Christ, in other words, what we have as a child of God and who we are as a child of God is so significant, it'll declaw our fears. When you know that God loves you, has your best interest in mind, that he's in control of everything, you and I can rest at ease and not be so filled with stress. You know, maybe tonight, as a, just throwing out an example there, maybe you're stressed about your bills. That's a very reasonable stress. <laughs> you know, I've had that before. But if you can, and I can come to the point where we recognize that, that if I'm seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, God will add out whatever is needed unto me. That my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. That, as David said in Psalm 37, I have been young, now I am old, and I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. See, that's the kind of stuff we have to come to be able to trust in. Come to trust in with, with those things. And that's just one area of stress. That's a big one in a lot of people's lives. It's just that God will take care of you if you are living responsibly and doing what you are supposed to be doing. Putting him first and, and, uh, and doing you what you can. And what comes up short, he will take care of. We can talk about lots of things in that area. You know, maybe you've got a circumstance, you don't know how it's going to end up. But just know this, God is in complete control. Say, it looks absolutely hopeless. God can, knows how to make a way where there's no way visible. God has, uh, has so many means of doing things, we can't even begin to understand that. But you and I have got to become secure in who we are in him, or else insecurity will rule the soul. And with that, all the stress and all the other negative things around that that none of us want. Do you know who you are in Jesus Christ tonight? Do you know who you are? I, I, I just saw, I think it was Ashley this morning, was cutting up some of those identity in Christ sheets. If you want one, they're free for the taking. If you had one and lost it, you can take another one. If you want a few of them just in case, take them. <laughs> the whole point is this. If you can know who you are in Christ, it will take a load of fear off your heart. And there are a lot of things he says about us, a lot of wonderful things. I think there's 36 things listed on that. There certainly could be more. But there are about 36 different ways in which God tells you he loves you. 
And you and I need to know that. You struggle with that, get on that list and start getting that stuff into your heart. It'll change everything about you. Secondly, the abiding in Christ. Now let's go to John 15, very close there. John 15, chapter number, or chapter number 15, verse 10. It says here, If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. John 15 speaks a lot about abiding in Christ, as we might say. And the word abide means simply to be or exist or to continue. To be, to dwell, rest, continue, stand firm, or be stationary for any time indefinitely. Can I put it this way? We need to, to, to help our fears, we need to just simply spend some time around the throne in his presence. Peace is not found in the absence of problems. Peace is found in the presence of God. Because you can't escape every problem in this world. So you and I have to find peace in his presence by abiding with him. And it's there at the throne, at the foot of the throne, we get to know him. And we have to experience time in his presence to fully appreciate his help in combating fear. If we spend very little time at all with him, you'll never get victory over fear. Life was not meant to be lived independent of God, even if you're a born-again Christian. Life is meant to be lived dependent upon him. And that takes time in his presence. I got this quote from a, a book I, that I've studied for this subject. He's, it mentions this. This is a good quote. Peace is the antithesis of anxiety. If you desire peace, you have to pursue the prince of peace and learn to live a responsible life dependent upon him. You can't just do away with anxiety. You overcome when you abide in Christ. You overcome when you abide in Christ. You know, John 14, verse 27, our text verse, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. That, it specifically comes from him. It's not something that we get in this world. It's something he gives. Have you experienced that? Do you know anything that I'm talking about here today? <laughs> in other words, when you get anxious and you get fearful, you get, you get down on your knees or however you are able to do it, and you just start to spend time talking to him. And you spend time in his word and let him talk to you. And you give it enough time, he will relieve that stress and that fear. He'll bring peace to your soul. It's not that we're never going to get fearful. That's a very real human emotion. It's what do we do when that fear hits? Now the world, they run to drugs, alcohol, entertainment, elicit everything that is wrong, trying to escape. We as God's people have a more righteous or fulfilling and helpful option. Take advantage of it. Take advantage of it. We live in a very stressful world and it's not looking like it's going to let up anytime soon. Right? <laughs> I mean, I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. But I know that I can find some help for my soul when I get around him. And if you know him, this is something that you can take advantage of. And in fact, you need to. See, only God can provide the antidote that is effective against our fears. But if we can't trust him because we do not know him or we, because we spend a little time in his presence, we just simply need to take some steps to correct that. Just take the steps. This, this isn't hard. It comes down to our old flesh that 
doesn't like to spend time with him. It takes a walk with God. Simply put. Well, isn't, my walk with God isn't working for me. Well, can I, can I ask you this? Number one, is everything right between you and the Heavenly Father? Or are there some things in your life that need to be confessed? You know, sin, unconfessed sin is an open door for Satan to rev up fears in your life. So if there's some things, some attitudes that need to be confessed and made right, then that needs to be done. Simply put. But it's not something that you're going to spend like two minutes with God. Okay, should be gone now. You know what? You might have to endure for a night. And then joy can come in the morning. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. How well do we wait on him? We, we live, I understand, we have been all programmed in this fast-paced society time frame in which we live, where we want things right now, because we're busy, and we've got things to do. Well, guess what? God doesn't work that way. God doesn't work on your timetable anymore. He works on mine. He works on his, and he wants you to do it his way. And that means just spending some time with him. Maybe it's not working because your mind is still dealing with wrong thinking. And it takes some time and some work to root out that wrong thinking. But if you get into the presence of God and get into his word, the, the, validity, uh, the validity of his word will become more of a reality to your heart. I've noticed as I spend more time with God, more time reading his word, the reality of who he is just becomes more enlightened in my being. And then all of a sudden, all those things that got me all worked up and stressed over begin to kind of melt away. But it takes time. But instead, we replace that time with whatever kind of entertainment stuff that we can throw in our face. Reading things and doing things and, you know, whatever escape we can find. I'm not against entertainment, but at the same time, too, entertainment can be a replacement for joy, a substitute for joy. It really can be. We need to get in God's presence. And God's word, will, as we spend time with him, will change everything within us. We all have to grow to trust the Lord more. And only making a relationship with him a top priority is that, is, that's the only way it's going to ever happen. You walk with God every single day of your life. I'm talking about where you spend designated time. I encourage, I always encourage people, do it in the morning, because then your brain's not 30 different directions. Where you get into the Word, you read it, you focus on things that God speaks to your heart about. I encourage people to journal it down. And then you spend time talking to Him about this, that, and whatever else he, he has led you to pray for. You know, we've got, I, recently we, we had a, a lady here make up some prayer journals. They're, they're excellent, they're, they're well done, and they're very organized. If you need some help with that, get one of those. Fairly inexpensive. Maybe you can do it on your own, whatever the case might be. But have a walk with God. Because in, only in your walk with God will He become real to you. He will become very real. And then it'll help eradicate some of that fear because only he can remove it. But if we barely know him on an intimate level, we'll never come to trust him enough so that he can eradicate our fear. So much of our fears could be dealt with by just simply finding the truths from God's word to combat the fears that consume us and allow God's presence to reassure us and cement that truth into our heart. The problem is we don't take the time to build that relationship with God. We're just too busy. Can I say if we're too busy? We are too busy. And that means there's some things that need to be taken out of the life. By the way, 
We will not succeed in anything we do in life if we put God in second place or lower. You'll get far more done in your day with God's power upon your life and my life than we will trying to ramble it ourselves and just, oh, I can handle it today, God. <laughs> he will show you that you cannot as much as he has showed me <laughs> many times over. We can't, just, we can't just do that. Hey, look. We need to take the time to build a relationship with God, to abide in Him. We can't expect overnight answers either, especially if we've been thinking and behaving in ways for a long time. But little by little, we can get victory if we are willing to take responsibility for the things that God expects us to do and trust Him for the things that only He can do. Otherwise, we just settle for defeat. And if we settle for defeat, that's what we will continually get, is defeat. You know, maybe tonight you have a struggle in, in some area. Maybe it's a fear of the future. Let's just throw that one as an example. There are so many verses in the scriptures that tell us about God's care for us that maybe we just need to meditate upon and memorize. We could talk about Matthew 6, 25 through 33. That's a great chapter on God's care for us and providing for our needs. Romans 8, 28 is a very good one. That's applicable in many areas. For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God who are called according to his purpose. There, there's so many need, there's so many things out there. And if we can get those things into our heart, then we can use those as weapons when, when we're tempted to fear. And when we're tempted to, to go down that road in our minds. The best defense for our mind is the saturation of the Word of God in it. Because it'll change how we think and our reactions to life's events. I like this quote from an author who said, you don't get rid of negative thoughts by trying not to think them. You ever tried to not think negative thoughts? Stop thinking negative thoughts. You, did, you tell yourself that. Stop thinking that. You know, it doesn't quite work. It's there. You overcome them by choosing the truth but you need to know what the truth is, right? And keep choosing the truth until the negative thoughts are drowned out or are completely replaced by the truth. And that's our responsibility. God puts that on us to learn the Word of God, right? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. You've got to know the Word. You've got to know what it says and how it applies in your particular life. God's not going to spoon-feed that to you. you know, He's not going to spoon-feed that to you. You and I have to take responsibility. But, God, but with His help, with his, the reality of His presence near my, that will cement those truths within our soul. Go to Acts chapter number 27. Paul here is on a ship heading to... I Heading to Italy, heading to Rome, I guess you could say. And if you know the story, it gets into a very bad storm. It appears that all hope is lost, that they will survive this. And suddenly, Paul, as, the, as a prisoner on this ship, um, stands before in the midst of them. Verse 21, we'll pick it up. It says, but after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve. Notice the security Paul had. I am God's and I am his servant. And the, and the message I got was saying, Fear not, Paul. Thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail 
with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God. And that it shall be even as it was told me. Where did Paul get security in the midst of very, very trying, stressful situation? God, the Lord. Now, we're not going to have an angel show up. But you know that the reality of God's presence and his word will bring that or even better security? It will. I like Philippians 4. If you want to flip there quick. Philippians chapter number 4. And I'm, I'm about done here. But th- these are some of my favorite verses. Ones I've clung to many, many times throughout my Christian life. Philippians 4. I think some of you probably could even quote it. Verses 6 and 7. Be careful or fearful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Where did Paul find peace in the midst of his problems? Writing, in this case, from a prison cell, it was in the presence of Almighty God. God gave him peace that passed his understanding. It's an internal peace that you cannot describe, you cannot muster up, but it's given as an act of God's grace. That is something that is available to each one of us today who have been saved. And it enables us to combat our fears. We'll pick it up with more next time as we continue on this subject of fighting fear. But you and I do not need to surrender to the fears that try to control us. Amen? And amen. Let's stand to our feet for a few moments. As the pianist comes, we're going to have a word of invitation. If the Lord has spoke to your heart and you'd like to spend some time in prayer, maybe you've got a fear you'd like to address before the Lord even tonight, I encourage you to do that. If God's tugged your heart, you can do it there at your chair. If you'd like to come down to the altar here,